Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome you as we gather to give our prayer and praise to our wonderful God, our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll follow the order for prayer and preaching as it's printed in your worship folders. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in you. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Jesus said, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Psalm 56. Be merciful to me, O God, for men hotly pursue me. All day long they press their attack. My slanderers pursue me all day long. Many are attacking me in their pride. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can mortal men do to me? All day long they twist my words. They are always plotting to harm me. They conspire. They lurk. They watch my steps, eager to take my life. On no account let them escape. In your anger, O God, bring down the nation. Record my lament. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Then my enemies will turn back when I call for help. By this I will know that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise. In the Lord, whose word I praise. In God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? I am under vows to you, O God. I will listen to my thank offerings to you. For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Passion reading for our midweek service after Lent 2 is recorded in the uh, Gospel according to the Evangelist Luke chapter 22. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. <coughs> On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Lord, if you are willing, take this cup from me. 
yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. <coughs> Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen. They said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour, when darkness reigns. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One, he was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. This evening, our look at Luther's small catechism focuses on the seventh petition of the Lord's Prayer. But deliver us from evil. What does this mean? We pray in this petition, in summary, that our Father in heaven would rescue us from every evil of body and soul, possessions and reputation. And finally, when our last hour comes, give us a blessed end and graciously take us from this valley of sorrow to himself in heaven. We continue by singing our theme hymn, Go to Dark Gethsemane. It is number 436. <laughs>
sisters in Christ, our glorious Lord and Savior. Reverend Dr. Gibbs, who wrote our midweek Lenten sermon series, is a big fan of a book series by Arthur Conan Doyle. Do you know who the main character of his writing is? Sherlock Holmes. Holmes is a private detective in London and a master of logical thinking, carefully, careful reading, reasoning based upon evidence and solving crimes. Holmes reveals that behind a crime wave in London of blackmail and murder is a single person, Professor Moriarty. Like a spider, weaving a web. Professor Moriarty is the root cause and the guiding mind. So Holmes needs to outwit and defeat his enemy, <coughs> who's never present at the crime scene, but behind it all. Why do I bring this up? When pondering Jesus' agony in the garden, his arrest, his trial, his uh, betrayal, or his denial by Peter? Well, to answer this question, consider another one. How many people are key to these events? One person who is key clearly is, of course, Jesus. Then we have others. Twelve apostles, including J uh, Judas, chief priests, the temple guard, a servant girl, and some crowds of people. They all play their part. But Luke's gospel reveals in a new, unique way behind all of this is really one person, <clears throat> Satan. There's Jesus, and there's his great enemy, who isn't even named in our reading this evening? Let me show you what I mean. All these examples that I'm going to cite are found in Luke's Gospel, and only Luke's Gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us that Jesus was directly tempted by the devil. When this time is over, though, only Luke tells us this. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left Jesus until an opportune time. Satan would be back. Perhaps you remember this one from our Ash Wednesday reading. 
Luke begins to tell the events of the Passover meal and the night when Jesus was going to be betrayed. First, he says the chief priests and their allies were looking for a way to get Jesus. Then he writes, Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot. And Judas went to the chief priests and officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. John's Gospel has a similar statement, but Luke makes it clear. The moment for which Satan has been waiting, the opportune time has come. Satan is behind the plot to arrest Jesus. And then there's last week's reading in verse 31. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. Yes, next comes Jesus' promise of Peter's turning back again after it's all said and done. But the fact remains, Satan is going to separate, sift, winnow, shake the apostles and see who is wheat and who is chaff, blown around by the wind. So in tonight's reading, there are Judas, the other apostles, the chief priests and their allies. But Satan is directing, influencing, and attacking all of them. He's behind it all. So in a way, there really are only two figures, two persons, Jesus and Satan. Jesus knows this, and he warns the disciples in the garden, pray, temptation is coming against you. Satan, the tempter, is coming against you. Pray so you won't enter into temptation. Because if you do, you will not be able to stand. You are not strong enough. You'll be blown away like chaff. Jesus knows Satan is behind it all. The chief priests and their groups think it's their clever secret plan. Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss and they arrest him. It looks like it was all their plan and that it worked. But Jesus knows better. I used to be in the temple courtyard every day. And if you wanted to arrest me as if I would have, were a robber, you could have done it then. But it's happening now because this is your hour and the power of darkness, namely Satan's. How? When the disciples ignore Jesus' warning for them to pray, how do they fare when Satan attacks? They scatter like chaff. While Jesus is praying in an agony that none of us can fully comprehend, the apostles fall asleep. Then one of the twelve betrays Jesus with a kiss. And Jesus has to undo the violence of another one of his disciples. Peter, who promised that he was ready with, to go with Jesus, to be arrested and to death, what happens? Well, he's following, but at a distance. Speaking through a servant girl and then two others, Satan comes at Peter and sifts him and Peter is undone. Jesus said it would happen. On his way to stand before the Sanhedrin, Jesus turns and looks over to Peter, and Peter remembers. But Peter not only remembers the bad news, or he only remembers the badness. He doesn't remember the good news that Jesus followed up with, that Peter would turn back. Peter goes outside, and he weeps bitterly. Not until after our Lord's resurrection 
will Peter be restored? Just as Jesus had promised him. So in a way then, every other human figure in this reading gets thinner and thinner and less and less substantial until they almost disappear. Yes, of course the religious authorities still have Jesus in their hold, but the power behind their evil is the evil one. So this reading shows Jesus versus Satan. Satan out to destroy Jesus. It doesn't sound too dramatic to say, but on one level, Satan will win. Satan will succeed. Here's the truly amazing thing about this. Jesus already knows this, and yet he willingly accepts it. So while the apostles are sleeping, Jesus is praying. He knows what's coming, and despite the mystery of his agony and struggle, his prayer and his choice are very clear. Father, your will be done. I will drink the cup. This cup is filled to the brim, full of God's response to evil and sin, full of God's rightful and righteous judgment. It's a cup prepared for people who are guilty, who are evil. The prophets of the Old Testament spoke of this cup it is for God's enemies to drink, but Jesus will drink it now. Though he's the only person ever to live who deserves not one single drop from this cup. The path toward drinking this cup runs through an arrest and trials, unfair and unfair accusations, spitting, beating, suffering, and finally, dying on the cross, all while carrying on his shoulders the weight of evil and Satan's hatred. It's enough to destroy anyone, in fact, everyone. Satan and his allies are out to destroy Jesus. In a way, they will succeed. The perfectly innocent Jesus will be numbered among the transgressors. The wages of sin is death, and Jesus will die. This much is crystal clear. Satan hates God, and he hates Jesus. So without a doubt, we might say that night, Satan intends all of this for evil. Evil against Judas, against the other apostles, against everyone including Jesus. But here's the glory and the wonder and the praise. God intends it for good, all of it for good. Ponder with me verse 61 in our reading this evening. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Jesus is bound, arrested, and on his way to death. But Luke still calls him the Lord. Peter is there in the courtyard of the high priest's house. As they lead Jesus out of the house, he turns and sees the man who has just denied he even knows Jesus. At that moment, all Peter can remember is Jesus' prediction that Peter would deny him. What he doesn't remember yet is that Jesus has prayed for him. And the time will come when Peter, the traitor, will turn back. As Jesus said, Peter's faith will return. And he'll straighten the others out who, like him, have been sifted like wheat. Peter doesn't seem to remember this promise. But Jesus certainly does. 
because he made the promise. Jesus knows God intends all of this for good, for Simon's good, for your good, and for mine. All the evil and all the authority of the evil one come against the innocent Son of God. Every sin, every accusation, every temptation comes against Jesus like a storm. And like a storm, it has an end. The evil expends itself and Jesus dies. But then, because God is the God of life and reversal, the God who takes evil and uses it for good, God raises his son from the dead, never to die again. Even death itself has no power any longer over the Lord Jesus. If death has no power, that means sin has no power either. And if death and sin have no power, that means that Satan has no power and is defeated. God wins in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We see Satan and Jesus. And we know how the contest is finished. God wins at Easter. And we win at Easter, too. But Satan is still working evil in our lives and in our world. In our text, we have to look closely to see Satan at work. He's behind the scenes, but he's there. In our day, we have amazing technology and science and godly gifts of human reason, and all of this can influence our thinking and partially blind us so that we go for long stretches without taking seriously Satan's power or his attacks. How can we remember and be more watchful? How can we respond when Satan's power keeps coming against us? Think about the seventh petition. Deliver us from evil. In Luther's large catechism, Martin Luther correctly reminds us that this really says, deliver us from the evil one, that is, from Satan. So every time you pray the Lord's Prayer, may this be a good reminder to you. Two more helps come from the Luther, and they are his prayers for morning and for evening as we will be praying again this evening. Both prayers end the same way. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Be aware. The best strategy and preparation. Well, one more thought. How do, they, do Satan's attacks come upon us? Two words, temptation and accusation. Satan seeks to turn us from God's will and ways to his ways to sin using temptation. In addition, he wants to take our sins after he succeeds with his temptations and condemn us and make us despair over ourselves and our lives. Remember how Peter was following Jesus? But from a distance? Well, when you realize that Satan is tempting you to sin, by faith, Claim the promise that you're not at a distance from the Lord. No, you're right there behind Jesus. Pray boldly in the power of the new life that I have in my Lord. Know 
to your temptation. I'm baptized, and I'm grafted together with Jesus. So I'm not giving in. I'm not giving in to get even. I'm not going to be selfish. I'm not going to murder someone by spreading gossip. No, I am baptized in Jesus, and I will follow him. As Christians, we do, of course, still sin, and you may have noticed that. When Satan takes the sins you've committed and he seems to be able to remember every one of them, you then, and then he takes those sins and throws them in your face. Claim your place right there behind Jesus. Grab hold of your baptism and hide there. That way, all of Satan's accusations strike Jesus, but they fall to the ground and disappear because they strike the risen, living Jesus who took your sins into the tomb and left them there. Satan's evil came against Jesus and it killed him, but God, his Father, raised him from the dead. Jesus chose this path knowing Satan intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. And you and I, we stand here today and we will stand forever behind our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now may the peace and love of our God that pass beyond our understanding guard and protect us in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. We join in our hymn of response in the hour of trial. This is found in the Lutheran hymnal number 516. <laughs> this evening. Uh, first of all, a prayer for the family of Cheryl Sides, a sister-in-law of Donna who passed away today, and then also for Jake Bollinger who was involved in a serious auto accident. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and pardon with all our heart and with all our mind 
Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. For the Holy Christian Church, here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the sick, injured, including Jake, and for the dying, and for all who care for them, including the family of Cheryl, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Finally, for these and all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Christ, Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. We close with our hymn, Nearer My God to Thee. It is found in the Lutheran Hymnal 533. Thank you.